Hi, so this video was prompted by a news report that I was listening to last night and it was about the British farmers and apparently the price they get paid for their milk is less than what it costs them to produce it. And the reason milk is so cheap at the moment is there's just so much out there. In fact, there's so much out there, the plan is to chuck it down the sink. And that kind of reminds me of the Milk Lake and Butter Mountains of years ago. But it also made me think, okay, if there's so much milk out there, what else can be done with it? Now, normally I avoid these kind of things, because, you know, it seems contraindicated. I mean, milk's a foodstuff, surely we should be using it to feed people. But apparently not. Apparently our choices are chucking it away, or are people going out of business. So what else can be done with milk? Now, milk was a really important industrial precursor just prior to the Second World War. What happened the Second World War, of course, is all milk production was turned to foodstuffs, and all the plastics, paints and glues that it was used for actually um, discovered petrochemicals, and since then petrochemicals have taken over. Now, of course, we frown quite heavily on petrochemicals and we're looking for um, new ways of approaching our needs for plastics, paints, glues and all kinds of things, and milk is back on the agenda, so to speak. Now, it's not the milk that's really interesting. It's the stuff that's in the milk. It's the milk protein, casein. Casein is an amazingly useful material. Now, you see quite a few videos around about how to make uh, plastics from milk and vinegar. And they're usually a bit disappointing in the plastics they produce are actually pretty crumbly and pretty poor. Uh, it's not to do with the skill of the people who are producing them, it's to do with the process steps that they take. They don't do enough purification, so at the end of the day they get a poor plastic. Now, casein is very often mixed with formaldehyde, it can mix with urea and formaldehyde to make industrial plastics. And we all want to shy away from that because it's formaldehyde. But formaldehyde is like using a chainsaw. A chainsaw is dangerous to use if you use it inappropriately without due care and attention. It's the same thing with formaldehyde. If you use it with due care and attention, it's not really going to be a problem. What you want to do is use it in a fume hood. So if you're going to use formaldehyde, by all means do, just use it with care. Now, I'm not proposing to use formaldehyde in these experiments, but just as a caveat, don't be afraid of using something, just take proper care of it. Now, the way to prepare your uh, casein is, first of all, to extract it. And what I've got here is some milk powder. It's just dried skimmed milk powder. Skimmed works well, best, because um, it's the fat content. If you can get rid of the fat in there and the sugars, then you're going to be okay. You're going to get pretty pure casein, and that's going to give you some pretty good results. And the first step, obviously, is to make up your milk powder, unless you buy the milk as ready-made milk. But the milk powder is pretty cheap and it's a good way of doing it. With the 60 grams of milk powder, you just add 600 milliliters of water and give it a stir and that will dissolve. So once you've dissolved your milk powder, you need to heat it up. Now you need to heat it up to hot and near boiling, but not boiling. You can do it in a pan or you can do it in the microwave. I'm gonna pop this into the microwave for a few minutes to get it nice and hot. Okay, so it's had three minutes in the microwave and it's nice and hot. And I've divided it into two because I'm going to need two things. One thing is I'm going to make an imitation ivory and the other thing is I'm going to make a lacquer for making paints. But the process steps are identical. Now, the way you precipitate the casein out of there is to add an acid. The acid denatures the protein. The casein is floating around in there as tiny little micelles. The addition of the acid makes it all clump together and the casein comes out of solution as big old clumps. And to be honest, it's almost magical. I love doing this bit because it clumps together all of a sudden. Now, you can use any acid. In an industrial process, you probably use hydrochloric acid. The reason you'd have hydrochloric acid is very easy to neutralise with something like sodium bicarbonate and you just get ordinary salt. So they use hydrochloric acid, but you can literally use any acid. Now, the common one that you see on YouTube is vinegar. Um, you can use lemon juice as well, and that's basically what I've got here is citric acid. I've got uh, one teaspoon of citric acid in 100 millilitres of water, and you don't need to add too much. If you add a lot of acid, the casein will actually form very tiny flakes that are a bit of a pain to get out. And so you stir your hot milk and just add a little bit of your acid in there until you get it to come together. And it will turn all of a sudden. And like I say, it's almost magical. There you go. There is the casein clumping together. And you can see how little acid I actually added. So now a little bit more just to make sure. And there's the casing clumped together now in this kind of yellowish solution. 
That yellowish solution, incidentally, are all the milk sugars and the other bits and pieces of protein kicking around in there. So if you were thinking about doing this as a process, then you would keep that because that can be neutralised. I mean, we've just put citric acid in here, so you could drink that if you wanted. It wouldn't do you any harm at all. But you keep that solution there because you can extra extract the milk sugars from it and they're a product in themselves. And so this bit is just magic. So now all you do is either pick or filter that off. After you've picked it out and dabbed it with a paper towel and given it a bit of a squeeze, this is what you get. Now this is your casing, and this casing is pretty impure. Now on other videos what they do is press this into a mould and call it plastic, and, and it is really, but it gives poor results because um, it's still pretty impure. And it's a shame because the purification steps aren't actually that difficult to do, and there's a number of ways of doing it. One is, casein will dissolve, albeit slowly, in alkali solutions. So you take your casein and you break it up and add some water and give it a zhuzh around with one of these things and it'll turn into a kind of creamy liquid. Then what you do is add some alkali. Now, I add ammonia. Um, this stuff's household cleaner, incidentally it's 35% ammonia, just buy that in the hardware store. Now, I get mine obviously as technical ammonia, which I get delivered. You give it a zhuzh around and then add some ammonia into there. Now the amount of ammonia that you add is very little, so I added 10 millilitres of that. And stir it. Now you stir it for quite a while, and it will go from creamy to this kind of clearish, and eventually get very clear. If it doesn't go clear, you need to add another 5 millilitres of ammonia. Now if you can't stand the idea of working with ammonia, that's not really a problem. Just use sodium bicarbonate instead, it'll take slightly longer. Or sodium carbonate, you can use that as well. Any alkali will dissolve casein. Now it dissolves the casein um, and breaks everything up. So if I then put more acid in there to neutralise the alkali and make that weakly acid, then the casein will come back out of solution again as more pure. So that's one way of doing it. I plan on using this to make a lacquer, so all I'm going to do is dissolve it and then get back to you with that. But there is another way to do this. And the other way to do this is to use this stuff. This is methanol, incidentally. You can also use ethanol. And you just pour the methanol or the ethanol onto your casing and give your casing a switch around for about five minutes in the methanol. And that will dissolve out any of the remaining salts. It'll help the fat particles separate. And it'll clean the water out of the casing so you get methanol soaked casing instead of water soaked casing a soaked casein. And it's a replacement, a solvent replacement. So we give that a mash around for about five minutes and then we can pick out the cleaned casein. So you can either decant off or filter off your methanol and you can see how dirty that's gone. Kind of a yellowish colour because it's full of all the excess bits and pieces that were in there. Um, and you can look at your casein. Your casein's got kind of stringy. It looks a bit like wheat gluten actually and it's kind of gone white. Now, at this stage, all those casein fibres are just broken up and all over the place. What we want to do now is clean it even further, but encourage those fibres to intermingle with each other so that the mass gets more plastic. Now, the way to do that is pretty simple. This is near boiling water. And all we do is add the boiling water and mash it around in there for about 10 or 15 minutes. You don't want to mash it too much or go too gloopy. You want to mash it until it's a nice plastic mash and those fibres have been intertangled, and that's what you're trying to do. Now obviously, if you were doing this on a larger scale, you wouldn't do it in beakers, you could do it in a bread mixer, for instance. And you just add enough water so you think you're going to be able to mash that around a bit reasonably. So I'm adding 300 millilitres of newly boiled water, and I'm going to mash that. Okay, so I warn you, it's not easy to do this, and you need to keep your water hot. So um, I will put this in the microwave, stirred it, put it in the microwave, stirred it and kept on mashing it around because if you let your water get cold the casein forms those tiny little clumps again what you want it to do is just like you make bread you want to intertwine those fibers before it cools down and forms that mass again and when it does that it'll start to form a clump in the bottom there that's quite sticky now it's a bit tough you have to work it but you can see the color that comes off these are all the impurities still now, i changed the water on this twice to get rid of those impurities and you can see the level of impurity that you're getting out there. 
And as I say, as you work your casein, those fibres will intertwine and it'll form a nice sticky mess. And that's what you're looking for. So as it begins to hold together, it forms this lump. It's almost like bubble gum. And now instead of being flaky, you can see that it's actually quite rubbery. And once you've got it to that rubbery stage, it's now ready to mould into something. And you can mould it into whatever shape that you want and leave it to dry. Now, if you want this to be really hard, then you would have to soak it in uh, formalin, which is a 40% solution of formaldehyde plus a few other extra bits and pieces. Now, obviously what you would do is fill a jar with your formalin, drop this in, screw the lid on and leave it. And you leave it for an amount of time that is uh, proportional to the thickness of the piece that you're making. So if you're making a piece that's um, quite thick, you'll have to leave it for a long time. And if you're making a very thin piece, a couple of hours will do it. Because the formaldehyde in formalin soaks into the case and forms cross-links, and that's what makes it really, really hard. But this one uh, was actually a recipe for artificial uh, ivory that I took from a book. And I'll drop the um, reference to the book in the description at the bottom there. It's available from Cornell University as a free download. It's a 1907 book and it's full of really good casein recipes and methods of making casein products um, from the 19, 1907. Uh, it really hasn't changed that much and it's pretty cool. So there we go. There's our imitation ivory. Now all we have to do is leave that to dry. So there it is after it's been pressed into a mould and I've stained it with graphite and you can see it's a black puck. That will go rock hard over the next few days and then you can um, sand it, cut it, shape it. It'll turn on the lathe as well. So there we go. How to make casein plus. So there is the casein busily dissolving. It's about halfway dissolved. When it's fully dissolved that will go clear. Now that's in ammonia. You don't have to use ammonia. You can use any alkali. You can use sodium hydrogen. Uh, sodium carbonate, sodium bicarbonate, sodium hydroxide, anything like that, as long as it's um, alkaline. I just chose ammonia. Now, once it's um, gone clear, you can use that as a base for paints and um, dyes because it makes a flexible, tough film. And here's one that I just spread out on a bit of glass and then dried. If you can see that, it's a see-through, pretty tough plastic film that it makes. So you can use the casing to do that as well. And as I say, I've got most of this stuff from that 1907 book, the references down in the description. But I hope it was of interest to you, and thank you very much for watching.